Hey, we are, we're here, and we're celebrating, and it, isn't it amazing? It, it's, it's quite a profound thought that 2,000 years ago, this little baby was born. Uh, from humble beginnings, he, he wasn't wealthy, he never commanded an army, he didn't get any political power or prestige throughout his entire life. He only managed to gather a handful of followers, and in his moment of darkest need, just before he was taken away by the Romans and crucified, they all split on him and left him alone. Yet here we are, 2,000 years later, and there are literally approximately 2.38 billion people around the world who are going to celebrate the birth of this baby that we know as, as Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I've been racking my brain today thinking, who else? Who else's birthday are we celebrating 2,000 years after they were born? And I'm running through the history books in my brain and I'm thinking, I can't think of anybody else that 2,000 years later, 2.38 billion people around the world in every continent, every tribe, nation and tongue, every language are going to gather together and we're going to basically be a part of the biggest birthday party celebration that there ever has been. Isn't that awesome? I was thinking of Live Aid. Anyone alive when Live Aid? Remember Live Aid years ago when they were raising money? Bob Geldof raised all that money. And, and I remember as a, as a small child watching that. And I thought that was epic, to be honest. I thought that was fantastic because I got to see all these bands that I loved and listened to when I was growing up. And here they were doing their, their bid. And, and there were just, there were, you know, millions. Of t- I can't remember what the TV audience was, but it was in the, in the millions. Yet tonight, tomorrow, over the next few days, there'll be 2.38 billion people tuning in to the celebration of the life of this man, Jesus. I just think that's amazing. And if there's nothing else that you think about out of what I'm going to share with us now tonight, I want you to think about that. Do some research. See if you can come up with another person in human history that 2,000 years after their birth, 2.38 billion people are still partying and celebrating (laughs) their life. I've got a funny feeling that the year I drop off the perch, that'll be it. The next year, no one's going to crack a cake or light a candle or, I mean, my family will remember me. I'm sure they will. But I don't think my birthday celebration will go on. I think that'll basically be it and life will go on. But it wasn't the case for Jesus. Hey, in December 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers, anyone ever heard of the Wright brothers? Yep, Paul, oh, Pauline, that was such a quick response. There you go, you can have a chocolate, Pauline. You pick whatever you want out of that box. You can grab whatever you want. There you go. Gee, we're a good church. We bribe people with chocolates. Look at that. You, everyone wants to come here. Oh, that wasn't meant to happen. Oh, well, I'll get to them later. In, in, in December 1903, after many attempts, the Wright brothers were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. They were thrilled about that, so they telegraphed a message to their sister Catherine, and here's what the telegraphed message said. It said, we've actually flown 120 feet. Okay, We've flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Now, Catherine was really excited about this, so she took off to the local newspaper, and she showed him the message. He glanced at it, and here's what he said. He said, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. They've just flown 120 feet. Nobody's ever flown 120 feet in the history of mankind. And all he got out of the message was, oh, great, they'll be home for Christmas. I think he missed the main point of the communication. I think he missed the main point of what she was trying to say. The Wright brothers did something back then. They flew 120 feet. Now, how many of you know that because of what they achieved and the invention of their flying machine, and the fact that they got it off the ground and it flew for 120 feet from that little thing. Big things grew, didn't they? Who's ever been on a plane? But you can thank the Wright brothers and that moment in human history where they flew a plane for 120 feet from something that seemed insignificant, something that looked kind of small. It's had a flow-on effect all throughout human history. And because of that, we can get on planes. Well, we can't last a couple of years, but we have been able to up until two years ago get on planes and fly all over the world. Now, that reminds me a little bit of the Jesus story. Yeah, a baby was born. 
And, 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 and yes, God came down here as believers, as Christians. We believe that was God in human flesh. And Jesus walked the earth for 33 years. And at the end of his life, he was mistreated. He was crucified and buried. And how many of you know that from that little thing, big things grow? How many of you know that from that moment in human history, that there's been a flow-on effect of the birth of Jesus Christ? Human history has never been the same from the time of Jesus' birth till now. Did you know that? Human history was altered, whether you want to believe it or not, whether we like it or we, 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 we deny it whenever, human history was altered by the birth and the life of Jesus Christ, like the birth and life of no other human being that's ever lived. Isn't that amazing? How many of you have got a holiday tomorrow? Who's not going to work? Guess what? You can thank Jesus for that. If it wasn't for Jesus, you'd be going to work tomorrow like every other day, earning the big bucks. But because of the birth of Jesus, you get to stay home. You get to chill out. You get to play with your, with your kids and catch up with your family and have a barbecue with your mates. How awesome is that? Well, you can thank Jesus for that. How many of you know the calendar that we use right now? It's, it, what year is it? It's 20, it's, it's 20, 21 AD. How many of you know AD is Latin for Anno Domini? It literally means in the year of our Lord, and it's actually referring to the person of Jesus Christ, this historical figure of Jesus Christ. And BC, it actually revolves around the birth. BC stands for before Christ. The entire calendar that you've been running off all this year is dated and revolves around this moment in human history and this person in human history called Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Not bad for somebody who apparently might not have existed. Is it true? Not bad for someone who many people will argue whether he really existed. Many people will argue about his significance and his relevance. I don't think it gets much more significant than that, to have the entire calendar of the world revolving around you. That's pretty significant. Tomorrow morning when everybody wakes up and doesn't have to go to work, they're going to feel like that's pretty significant. Well, thank Jesus that you get the holiday that you get tomorrow. From the life and the birth of Jesus, there's been a flow-on effect. And just like how the Wright brothers, there was a flow-on effect and it changed aviation forever. Hey, the life of Jesus had a flow-on effect and it's changed more than just aviation. It's actually changed the world. It's changed the world. Now, I came across a list the other day and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some lollies out here. So this is a bit of a test. So feel free to, to shout out if you think you know the answer. I came across a list the other day of the top 10 influencers across all social media platforms. Hands up if you're on social media in this room. Hands up. Straight up, nice and high. Yep, fair few people. Okay, hands down. Hands up if you just lied about it. <laughs> hands up if you are, but you're embarrassed. You don't want anyone to think you are because social media is evil, and so you kept your hand down to be a good little... Ben, ben Luca. <laughs> Anybody else besides Ben Luca? I could do it again. Hands up if you're on social media. Most people are on some form of social media these days, aren't they? Facebook, Insta... Um, Graham, there's other ones, Twitter, Twitter, who come up with that name? How dumb is that? I'm on Twitter. It's not even tough. Some twit came up with Twitter, good one. Anyway, I came across a list the other day of the top 10 influencers across all social media platforms. So I'm going to start uh, number 10. Number 10, anyone, anyone, anyone want to, I'll run through the bottom seven, I'll let you guess the top three. Number 10 was Kim Kardashian. Anyone follow Kim Kardashian on social media? No one's going to tell me the truth about that, are they? Of course you're not. We're all good church people. Kim Kardashian has 319 million people following it on social media platforms. 319 million people following Kim Kardashian. At number nine is Rihanna. She has 3.32 million. At number eight is Kylie Jenner. At 333 million. Katy Perry's number seven at 338 million. You see if you can guess this one at number six. Anyone see me? No, nah, not oh, the rock, you got it. I'm popping my pecs in case you could. It helps if I had pecs, but that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> there you go, you can have a chocolate. Throw it at me. Remember the movie? Don't do it. Pop, 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 pop. Number five, who can guess number five? Social media influencer number five. Um, it's a girl. I'm trying to think of some of her songs. Um, parents, you've probably been driven insane by her music in the last 10 years. No, close. More insane. 
Billy Eilish, no. Ah, oh, Taylor Swift, Joe, take a chocolate. Well done, awesome. I didn't want to throw it, I don't want to hit anyone in the eye. Number four is Selena Gomez on 425 million, 425 million people following Selena Gomez. Number three is Ariana Grande, 429. Number two, who can guess number two? Who, who do you reckon is number two? He a, was a young boy. Started singing, yeah, Justin Bieber. If you don't like your chocolate, you can trade it in later. Got many flavors up here, tons of different flavors up here. And number one, number one, with 517 million followers across all social media platforms, can anybody tell me who that might be? I'll give you a clue. Are you watching? Hang on. Who said it? Ronaldo! Woo! -hoo! There you go. You can have that. Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo, 5.17. 500. 5.17 million followers. But even with all them top 10 guys, 5.17 million followers, or sorry, 517 million, I've my glasses on, 517 million followers, yet Jesus has about 2.38 billion followers. And Jesus doesn't even have an Instagram page. He doesn't have a Facebook. He doesn't have a Twit face account. He has nothing. And he lived 2,000 years ago. Yet he has two. <laughs> 0.38 billion followers. There's something about this person whose birthday that we're celebrating. H.G. Wells, I don't know if you know H.G. Wells. He was an author and historian. You might know The, the Invisible Man. He wrote The Invisible Man. Uh, he wrote The Time Machine. Anyone seen the old classic The Time Machine? Yep. He also wrote War, uh, War of the Worlds. It was also one of his as well. Here's what H.G. Wells had to say about the person of Jesus. He said this. He said, I am an historian. I am not a believer. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. This is H.G. Wells, who's not a believer, who's a historian, and based on his research, he came to the conclusion Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history of human history. If I was to ask you the question tonight, who is Jesus? What would be your answer to that question? What would you think about that question? In Matthew chapter 16, there's this, this, this interesting story. Matthew was a, 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 a follower of Jesus, the, the, the book of Matthew. Sometimes when we look at this, we, we, we call this the biggest selling book of all time, but it's, it was never written as a book. It's, it's 66 individual ancient historical documents written over a period of 1,500 years on three separate continents of the world. And yet it tells this story that points forward to the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus in what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament points back to the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. What are the chances of 1,500 years span, 66 different authors writing a story, not being able to sit and communicate with one another, yet all getting the story to line up and match up again? I think that's as amazing as 2,000 years after he's born, having 2.38 billion people celebrating your birthday. There's just something about the Christian faith and something about Jesus that is worth at least investigating, looking into, and asking questions about. In Matthew chapter 16, Matthew records this situation where Jesus uh, had his, his followers, we, the, the church people, we call them disciples. You ever heard of the 12 disciples? Yep, the 12 apostles. It's not just a rock formation off, off the South Australian coast. How many are left now? There's not many of them left, is there? They're all toppling over. I got a photo of them back in the day just before they all fell. So these guys are following Jesus and Jesus sits them down one day and in Matthew 16, he has this conversation with them. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, it's in verse 13 to verse 16, it says, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So who do other people say I am? Now, we live in a world right now, and we could do a poll in our communities or in our families or our households, our schools, our universities, and we get a whole range of answers, wouldn't we, about who, 
Who is Jesus? We can, we can find out what other people think about him. And we live in a world where other people don't mind telling you what they think about him too, by the way. Trust me. Years and years ago, I used to go into universities and, and, and we used to do uh, what, what, what Christians call outreaches. And we would just go and we would set up in university campuses in cafeterias at lunchtime to capture everybody. And we would just stand up and start telling them about Jesus and the way he's changed our lives and the transformation in our lives. And believe you me, they didn't mind telling me what they thought about Jesus either. They didn't mind telling me what they thought about me telling them what I thought about Jesus either. Some of them didn't want to speak. they just walk up like this and hope you'd back down. So who do people say the Son of Man is? Everybody's got their opinions and their ideas. Your, your, your community, your friends, your workplace, everyone's going to have an idea about who Jesus is. But then Jesus says this. He says, but what about you? He says, who do you say I am? Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Who do you say Jesus is? Each person sitting in this room who do you think Jesus is? Now, I can tell you this. Before I came to faith, if somebody had have said to me, what do you think about Jesus? I would have said this. I don't think about Jesus. I don't think about Jesus. I don't care. Jesus is absolutely irrelevant to my world. That's what I would have told you. See, I wasn't brought up in the church, wasn't brought up with the Bible, wasn't brought up with any religious kind of stuff around me. And the first time I ever heard about Jesus, I think I was 12 years of age, I was in a scripture class at Evans Head Primary School. And the only real reason I remember that day was because it was Melbourne Cup Day. And the lady hadn't even started to talk about Jesus when the Melbourne Cup came on and all the teachers came in the library and said, righty, I wrap it up, the cup's on, they turned on the telly. But I do remember she started to tell us something about this character called Jesus. That was the first time I'd ever heard of Jesus. Jesus could have been a brand of brand new bamboo underpants for all I knew. I literally had no context for what a Jesus thing was. And then from that little seed in my life, things began to germinate and grow. And at 19 years of age, I came to my decision that if Jesus had sat me down and said to me, who do you say I am? I could have had an answer very similar to what Peter said to him here when Peter said, I think you are the son of God. I think you're God. I think you're the one that we've been waiting for that's going to come and do something that's going to allow me, a mere human being who's imperfect and dirty, to have a relationship with a perfect and holy God once again. I think you're the one that's going to come and take away that stuff that's between me and God, that kind of stuff that I can't take away. I think you're the one that's going to bring the goodness into my world, you know, that goodness that I can't produce myself because I'm just not that good. You're the one that's going to come and clean up my life, those areas where I can't clean myself because the stains are too deep and too entrenched in my world, but you can bring your scourer down and you can do that which only you can do and make me clean and allow me to enter into life and life abundantly, the kind of life that God created me for. See, I don't believe that God put us down here just to exist. Most people simply exist. They don't live. There's a massive difference between living and existing. Massive difference. And I think I existed for about 19 years. And then when I opened myself up to the reality of God and stepped across that line and made a decision, and that's what it is, it's a decision to follow after Jesus, things began to change in my life. All of a sudden, I began to see God in ways that I'd only heard about before. I began to experience this God that I'd, I'd only read about and other people had told me about. It didn't start until I made that decision. I felt like I'd gathered enough information, heard enough, experienced, seen enough to go, you know what, I think I'm going to step across this threshold and I think I'm going to go after God. What have I got to lose? My life sucked anyway. I had nothing to lose. It wasn't going to get any worse. And praise God, it became really, really good. Jesus came and he said, who do people say I am? Then he said, who do you say I am? You see, here's the thing. I thought that Jesus was totally irrelevant to my life. And this is my point, I guess, I want you to think about tonight. I thought Jesus was totally irrelevant to my world because I wasn't brought up in a church. I thought Jesus was irrelevant to my world because I never read a Bible. I thought Jesus was irrelevant to my world because I didn't say prayers. I thought Jesus was irrelevant to my world because I wasn't religious. I thought Jesus was irrelevant to my world because I didn't think about him. And had you asked me, what do you think? I would have said, I don't think. Probably like many people in this room here tonight. But you know what I've realized? Jesus was not irrelevant to my world. As a matter of fact, Jesus was incredibly relevant to my world. I just had no idea how relevant Jesus was to the world. I had no idea the influence that this man had had throughout human history and the influence this man had had on certain sections of society and the world in which I lived in. And here's the thing, every time we celebrate Christmas, 
We think about the birth of Jesus, we're confronted with the reality that he actually lived, and we're confronted with the question, who was he? And guess what? You know what's going to happen? You can get up out of here tonight and you can walk away and forget all about Jesus. You know what's going to happen in 366 days? We're going to celebrate his birth again. And if you don't want to think about it then, that's okay. Guess what's going to happen another 365 days after that? We're going to celebrate him again and again. And for the rest of your life, every 365 days, the name of Jesus is going to pop up again and pop up again and pop up again and pop up again. And so I hope... I hope that you get intrigued enough to not believe everything I say, but I hope that at some point something sparks in you and you go, right here. Oh, 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 when we used to go into universities, here's, here's what used to happen a lot of times. I'd get guys that would pull me aside. Great thinkers, great intellects, way smarter than me. If you get to know me, I'm not the smartest human being. I'm, I'm pretty average. But I do love God. And they used to pull me aside and they used to say this to me. They used to say to me, you Christians are so gullible. And I would say, really, why? <laughs> why am I so gullible? Well, because you believe in God and you just believe what the church tells you and blah, blah, blah. Then I'd explain to them, well, I actually had nothing to do with the church until I came to believing in God. So they had nothing to do with me kind of believing this stuff. It was, can't blame them. But let me ask you a question. Who's the most gullible? The person who investigates and asks the questions and reads the books and looks into it and comes to the conclusion that God is real? Or the person who's just brought up in a world that says he's not and you just believe it? Who's the gullible one? Who's the gullible one? If you don't believe in God, that's fine. At least have a reason why, other than the rest of the world doesn't. It doesn't make sense. A lot of things don't make sense. Microwave ovens don't make sense. How can I put that pie in there? It's completely frozen. I, can, I could knock a nail in with that pie, and in three minutes, it's soft. It doesn't make sense. How can we put a man on the moon? It doesn't make sense. My wife loves me. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> we produce this beautiful young girl. It doesn't make sense. I love my mother-in-law. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> there are a lot of things in life that just don't make sense. But we believe him. So check it out. Think about it. Think about the Jesus story. Because this day is going to come around again and again and again. Let me just give you a couple of quick things to think about. The influence of Jesus throughout human history. Number one, uh, his influence on the scientific world. Um, anyone know Richard Dawkins? Anyone ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins is an atheist. He's not really into God. He doesn't like Christians. And here's what Richard Dawkins claims. He said, I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. He says, I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. You know, if you do your research into history, you will find that some of the greatest scientific discoveries were made by people who were influenced and shaped by the life of Jesus Christ. Some of the greatest scientific discoveries ever, some of the greatest inventions ever, came from people who were motivated by their faith and their understanding of God and their understanding of a universe that God created. Therefore, because God created it, it could be understood. It could be understood. Anyone ever heard of Blaise Pascal? Blaise Pascal. I think I said his name. Blaise, there we go. You've got a chocolate up the back there. Oh, sorry. I'm going to take an eye out here. Blaise Pascal. He's known for discovering principles of... Uh, sorry, here we go. Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician, physicist, and inventor. He laid the foundation for the modern theory of probabilities. Anyone ever do probabilities at maths? Yep, well, you can blame him for that. Anyone not enjoy doing probabilities in maths? Yeah. It's easy to invent something. Try studying it for the next two days. It's in the classroom and be taught it. Louis Pasteur. Anyone ever heard of Louis Pasteur? <laughs> I'll just give you the whole box. There we go. We've got one here. Louis Pasteur. There we go. Oh, bad shot again. Louis Pasteur, he was known for discovering the principles of vaccinations, pasteurization. Everyone ever drink pasteurized milk? Well, you can thank old Louis for that. Because of Louis, you're drinking pasteurized milk. And fermentation. <laughs> We're in church. I won't say too much more about that one. In fact, he actually saved, he saved the beer and the wine industry in France. Did you know that? He saved the French beer and wine industry. He developed vaccines against anthrax and rabies. Robert Boyle. 
Robert Boyle is known as the father of modern chemistry. And so much of our modern world, from plastics through to medicines, are a result of his scientific breakthroughs. Isaac Newton, anyone ever heard of Isaac Newton? <laughs> anyone else heard of Isaac Newton? Yeah, there you go, Bev, and I'll roll it so I don't take an eye out. Isaac Newton, he's well known for discoveries in optics and mathematical calculus. Anyone do calculus at school? Yes, well, you must hate him because he came up with it. And the basic principles of modern physics. Anyone do physics at school? Well, I'll guarantee you've been studying stuff that came from Isaac Newton. Anyone heard of Nicholas Copernicus? That was one I hadn't heard of before. Yes, okay. I'm going to buy you a whole box at the end of the day. You're going to have a whole box of chocolates. Nicholas Copernicus, he developed the theory that the sun was actually the center of the universe, not the earth. But guess what? He was right. And here's what Copernicus had to say. He said, to know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and power, to appreciate in degree the wonderful workings of his laws, surely all this must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High, to whom ignorance cannot be more grateful than knowledge. John Ray. Anyone ever heard of John Ray? There we go. I'll get you on this one, might I? John Ray. Guess what? John Ray was the guy that cut a tree in half and was the first one to work out why has it got all those rings inside of it? Got any arborists here? Any arborists here cutting down trees? You ever cut down a tree? You ever seen the rings? Yeah, well, he beat you to it. And he came up with the whole theory of that, and he was the guy to discover what all the rings work. And here's the thing about every single one of those people. There's evidence from their own writings. This is not in the Bible. This is their own writings, their own diaries, their own journals. Every single one of those guys were followers of Jesus Christ. Every one of them were men uh, who were influenced by Jesus, his teachings, his values, and they'd committed their lives to him and followed after him. It's amazing when you go back and you look through science how many great inventions and scientific breakthroughs were made by men of faith, men who were influenced and followed Jesus. In fact, sociologist Rodney Stark, he did a research, he researched the top 52 most influential scientists who launched the scientific revolution, which was from, I think, between 1500 to 1700, when, we, when, when most of our scientific breakthroughs, the platforms were laid then, and we've continued to build on them for the last however many centuries. But from 1500 to 1700, he researched the top 52 most influential scientists, and he found this, 98% were followers of Jesus. 98%, that's amazing. And yet here we are having Hawkins say that science, that, 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 that religion teaches us not to examine the world or not to understand. Yet most of our scientific breakthroughs and understanding and knowledge have come from those who were influenced by Jesus. They studied creation because they believed it was a way to study the God who made everything. In fact, without Christianity, without the life of Jesus, think about this, we probably wouldn't even have science. Because many Eastern religions will teach you that truth is, there's nothing solid about truth. You've got your own truth and you've got your own truth. Well, 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 if truth is that transient and there's no such thing as absolute truth, then there's no science to study. There's no science to study. There's no foundation to build upon. Science only works if truth exists and can be discovered. Jesus had a massive influence on science. His influence on education. Jesus Christ's life and teachings have had a massive influence on education. You don't realize it, but the school you went to and the fact that you were able to go to school and get the education you got, if you trace the seeds of that right back, you'll go right back to the church. You'll go right back to men and women who thought that that everybody had a right to be educated. As a matter of fact, you'll go right back to the very first thing that they thought people needed to understand, which was actually these ancient documents that we call the Bible. And then from there, as education facilities went on, monks started universities. Did you know that? Yeah, most universities were started by monks. The seed of all your educational facilities, the seeds of them were started by people who actually followed Jesus and decided that, you know what, everybody needs to learn. Everybody needs to learn. Isn't that interesting? And yet here I was thinking, Jesus has no relevance to my life. Yet here I was sitting in a school that if it wasn't for Jesus' followers, maybe that wouldn't exist the way that it did. He has had an influence on the world. Of the top 10 universities in the world today, every one of those top 10 universities in the world today was started by followers of Jesus. Matter of fact, you go to some of them, Yale, Princeton, some of these now, and their, 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 uh, what do you call it, their mantras, their statements and so on still are very biblical and still talk about the reason why the university was founded and started in the first place, to glorify God, to honor God. It's amazing. The thirdly is influence on hospitals. Who's ever been to a hospital? A doctor. Medicine. Yep. As early as the second century, historians describe how Jesus' followers would regularly take in orphans 
And they'd regularly take in the sick, even when other people felt like they were diseased and wanted to distance themselves from them. It was Christians, people influenced by Jesus Christ, that would go into the streets and bring these people in and care for them when even their own families had left them on the streets to die. Back in Roman times, they used to take babies who were, who were deformed or whatever, and they would just throw them in the rivers, and the Christians would walk out into the water, and they would gather these deformed, throwaway babies, and they would take them home, and they would raise these babies themselves, and the Romans would laugh at them and mock them for caring for these deformed and sick children. Yet it was followers of Jesus, who, people who were influenced by the life and teaching of Jesus, that went out and did that. You can go right throughout the world and you can look at all the best parts, the things that you think are the best parts of the world, equality, women's rights. You can look at all these things and you'll find in the teachings and the person of Jesus and in, the, in the, 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 the workings of those that were influenced by Jesus, the seeds of these things being planted and being given birth to in the world today. Christians were mocked for wading into the water and doing this, but they believed in the value of human life and they believed that everybody was made in the image of God, therefore everybody deserved the dignity of being loved and cared for. It's a Christian ideal. It came from Jesus. Edward Jenner, who's known as the father of immunology, he created the first ever vaccine. And it's estimated that Jenner's discovery, this is by UNICEF, quoted by UNICEF, they, they estimate that Jenner's discovery... Of, of the foundation of vaccines saves over 9 million lives per year. 9 million lives per year from this one man. Here's what Jenna had to say. He said, I'm not surprised that men are not grateful to me, but I wonder that they are not grateful to God for the good which he has made me the instrument of conveying to my fellow creatures. If it wasn't for a follower of Jesus, maybe we wouldn't even have vaccines. Isn't that amazing? Influenced by God the transforming power of God, the stuff that God did in this man's life. The top 10 hospitals in the United States were all started by followers of Jesus. You'll barely go through a day without confronting something that's been influenced by the life of this man. And that's the reality. And if that's not enough, you would at least think about who Jesus is. If that's not enough to at least pick your interest. If that's not enough for you at least to make the decision, hey, if you hate Jesus, that's fine. I just want you to find out why you hate him. If you don't believe in Jesus, that's fine. But why don't you think about why you don't believe in Jesus? There's that much evidence for his birth. Not, I'm not talking about these documents here. You can go and find in ancient historical documents people that didn't even believe in Jesus, pe people, sorry, that didn't, didn't like Jesus, that weren't Christians, that didn't follow Jesus, will write about the person of Jesus. He's one of the most attested to human beings in human history, Jesus Christ. More than Julius Caesar, more than King Arthur. More ancient sources and documents talk about this man. Not only the more ancient documents talk about him, but you and I live and walk in so much of the freedoms and the liberties and the, and the blessings that he brought to planet Earth today. We're so immune to some of that stuff and so used to it, we don't even think about it. We don't realize if it wasn't for this man, Jesus, we may not be walking and living in a lot of those things today. He's the most influential man that there's ever been in human history. There's something about this man that we simply cannot ignore. I'll finish with this. There's a poem or a story by a guy called Dr. James Allen Francis, written in 1926. It's called One Solitary Life, and here's what he wrote. He said he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village when he worked in a carpenter's shop. Until he was 30... When public opinion turned against him, he never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never went to college, he never visited a big city, he never travelled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33, his friends ran away, one of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Can I encourage you tonight? I don't know you all in this place. But can I encourage you, this Christmas, 
Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your family. Have a blast. Have a great time. God is a life-giving God. He wants you to enjoy yourself. But can I encourage you? Don't miss the big picture. Don't miss the reason why you get the opportunity to enjoy the things you're going to get to opportunity. 2,000 years ago, God came down to earth as a man. His name was Jesus. And the power of Jesus' life was not that he took over a government or that he changed the nation. The power of Jesus was his ability to transform one human heart at a time, one person at a time, bring hope to one person at a time, change to one person at a time. And by doing so, he's become the most influential man in human history. At 19 years of age, I came to the decision. I was sitting in my caravan one night, and I'd been out with all my mates, and we were all done what boys do, you know, boys go out and do. And I was sitting in my caravan, and I sat up about 5 o'clock in the morning. I looked around my caravan. I had one of my mates asleep on the ta- kitchen table, one guy on the chair, one on the floor, just bodies all around my caravan because that's where we all went to my place, got doled up, went out, hit the town, did what we did, came home, everyone crashed in my caravan. And I sat up this morning, and I sat up in my bed, and I looked around my room, and this voice said to me deep inside, and these were the words, if this is all there is to life, Alan, why don't you end it right now? And I was always the life of the party. I was the guy that could make everybody laugh, always with a smile on his face, always out for a good time. But deep down inside, when I was alone, the party was over and everything had worn off, I would cry myself to sleep because I just couldn't find a purpose. Why am I here? The bad things seemed to outweigh the good. And when I sat up that morning and I heard that voice, I knew if I could reach something, if there was something near me, I I know I wouldn't be here today. I would have done it. And I began a journey. I began a journey. At 19 years of age, standing on a roundabout in the middle of the Pacific Highway in Balna, there's traffic lights there now, you know, Kerr Street and River Street, traffic lights. Used to be a roundabout there. And I found myself one day standing on that roundabout with trucks and buses going around me. And I just said, God, I actually think you're there. I think you're there. And I want to give myself to you. And if you can take this life, this mess I've created, and do something good with it, I want you to have it. And it began a process of transformation in my life. Married, four beautiful kids, got a good life. It's not a perfect life, but it's a good life. But that emptiness, that thing that caused me that morning to realize I could reach for something, that emptiness has been filled. And I know there are probably people in this room, and you probably, like me, you tried a whole bunch of other things, and you probably got a smile on your face and you're happy. But deep down inside, you know you're made for something more. You know there's more to life than what you can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. And I just want to encourage you. Do something with that feeling. Go and talk to somebody. Pick up a Bible. If you don't have one, come and see me. I'll get you one. Read what these ancient writers had to say. Ask some questions. Explore the person of Jesus because I I believe in him. You'll find answers to those questions. If you don't mind, I'm going to finish by praying. Can we get the band up? Is that okay? Now, when I'm going to pray and then we're kind of finished. If you need to cruise, that's good. There's tea and coffee next door. Uh, But we're going to do Joy to the World again to finish off. Um... But I just want to pray for us, if that's okay. So God, I want to pray for each person in this room right now. God, I pray. I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to each person, just as you did to those 12 disciples, those 12 guys that had such a radical encounter with you that they physically died for that faith. They could not deny that you actually were God in human form, right to the very end. Lord, you've changed my life, and God, you've changed a lot of people in this room's lives as well. And I pray for those in this room this evening that are searching, that are asking questions. God, I even pray for those tonight. I believe, God, you've been tickling people's hearts. You've been, you've been touching them on the inside, and there are people here, and they may be thinking about you in a different way, maybe for the first time. I just pray, Lord, would you take them on a journey, and would you reveal yourself to them, God. Show them that you are everything that these ancient writers say you are. You are the Son of God. You are the one that came and died on a cross so that we could have relationship with God, so that we could actually know this awesome creator of the universe. And so that we could be whole again and have those empty places filled. So Father, I commit every person in this room into your hands. And God, I pray, give us a great time of celebration over these next couple of days with our friends, with our families. Be with each person, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone that knows Jesus said with me, amen, amen. amen. We're going to sing joy to the world.
Grab a tea and coffee if you'd like. You can stay and sing with us if you want. You can cruise if you want, whatever. Uh, if I don't get to see you again because you just popped in because it's the Easter Christmas thing, it's been fantastic having you with us. Really, really appreciate you coming. And I know there's some people online watching us as well. One of them's my son, Jordan in Newcastle. Good to see you, Geordie. Well, it's good for you to see me, actually, but we'll see you very shortly. So if I don't see you, bless you. Have a great life. And don't ever forget the person of Jesus. Amen.